There is indeed. I've got one. <laughs> if you're up for it. <laughs> I've also I've also been a bit cheeky. I've got um more. Not more. Go I've on. got mini eggs. <laughs> so, hi guys. It's Izzy. I'm actually back for a new video. I've got a quite interesting one. I think it's interesting anyway. I've got my housemate Jordan behind the camera just because I wanted to gauge her real life reaction to this because I was told this story about my friend, um, not about my friend, by my friend Selena. <laughs> Selena is not involved in this story whatsoever. That would be a very interesting one. I had heard one of the cases uh, to do with this and I had no idea about how crazy this guy's full story is and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to cover this on my YouTube channel. Uh, so he's a French guy and I am going to butcher the name. Uh, so he's called Frederick. I can just about make that one out, but Bourdon. I, the French, they say it in like such a cool accent and stuff, but I'm just going to, it's not how you pronounce it, but Bourdon, that's the best I can do with my accent. I have found out about one of his cases in particular. And like I said, I had no idea how deep it was. I thought it was uh, to do with like the sort of same along the lines of um, the Walter Collins case, which I've covered on my channel. I don't know. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I, that one. I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was going to be like a story like that, where it's just a bit of a mismatched story, weird enough as it is. But this one is so much stranger. Frederick Bourdon is also known as the guy with 500 identities. So a little background story to him, he was this French man and he was born to a woman who was a teenager when she had him and he's always said since his birth he's felt like he's not been wanted. So his mother fell pregnant with him and his grandfather actually told her to abort the baby so he felt like he was very very not loved from a young age and ever since then he's sort of, well not since then but since his teenage years he started running away and picking up the identities of uh, just different missing children. He used to make up that he was a missing child and he'd just go from care home to care home to care home right into his like early adulthood because he just always wanted that feeling of being loved and when he felt he didn't get that, he'd just make up a new identity and would just go from care home to care home hoping that one day someone would like pick him up. It's quite sad actually when you think about it. Yeah, he just always wanted that feeling of being loved and belonging somewhere and when he felt he didn't he would just make up a new identity and move on and just really hope that one day one would stick and he could just start his life from fresh. He was sort of known as the chameleon because he would just always change his whereabouts, his location, his identity. He would just act like he was someone else. We could get into one particular case um, but just as a bit of background, he assumed the identity of uh, a 14 year old bo French boy who'd been missing since 1996. How old was he? Uh, Leo well this was after this one, so this was in 2003, so he was in his 20s going on to his 30s at this time. So he pretended that he was a 14 year old boy and then a DNA test tested that he wasn't actually this missing boy. After that in 2004. He was found in Spain and he was pretending to be a missing boy uh, whose mother had been killed in the Madrid bomb attacks. Why you would make this stuff up, I don't know. Like, surely there's... Any... Like, it's bear in mind this was after this other incident, which was just a big enough as it is. You think you would just call it a day, but he didn't. Uh, then the police found out the truth and they deported him back to France and were like, you're not this missing kid either. And then in 2005, you still hadn't had enough. Do you have a picture of him? Uh, yeah, I'll get. I'll, I'll, I'll show you pictures for interest. <laughs> actually, how old he looks. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. So in 2005, he made up another identity and pretended he was a Spanish orphan, and then he was actually caught out because someone had seen a TV documentary, and they were like, "You're that guy that pretends to be teenagers. You were pretending to be Leo Bally before," and they were like, "Nope." You're not him. Like, just stop doing this. Wait, is this going to be he pretends to be someone that actually he is? Oh, that twist? would be a plot twist. Oh, so he's gone full circle. And he's going, <laughs> yeah. oh, that, that, I think that's the one thing he's left to do is to pretend to be himself. Like a boy who wolf. He's like, no, I really am him. <laughs> um, no, this one is a bit sadder than that, unfortunately. Um, he gets a lot of people very, very upset. There was just too many things. It's one of these stories that if they made a TV show about it, do you think, like, no way could that happen in real life. That's so far-fetched. There's no way this person would get away with it. But even Bourdain himself is like, 
I was given this chance to assume this identity and he just believes it was meant to be. He believes he was meant to like get this personality in his life um, or identity. I keep saying personality, he's not got 500 personalities. Um, there's also a film about this that's been made which is very very interesting, it's called The Imposter and I just watched it this morning because it wasn't on YouTube uh, for a very very long time and I've been trying to find it for like ages and ages and ages on the internet and it didn't exist but this morning when I was just jogging my memory I found it was actually uploaded to YouTube so I'm going to leave it in the link below, uh, might get taken down, might stay up so yeah be sure to watch that after this if you're intrigued for more. So his most famous impersonation and his most famous case was when he assumed the case of Nicholas Barkley, I don't know if you've heard of him before. No, so this is the um, missing persons case that I heard before and like I said I thought it was just he just pretended to be him and got away with it for a little while and then didn't and that was it but this story is crazy. So Nicholas Patrick Barkley was born on December 31st 1980. Here is her brother Nick. had a mother, Beverly Dollahide, and he was the youngest in his family. So he grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and he was sort of known for being troubled. He had quite a yeah, troubled, rough upbringing. It was a nice area where they lived, uh, but this particular family, like, neighbours reported police, like, turning up to the house on several occasions because of arguments that sort of blew up in the family home. So Nicholas Barclay went missing on the 13th of June, 1994, which Weird coincidence, I don't know if you think this is weird, it's actually Bourdain's birthday. So yeah, weird coincidence that one, but he was uh, playing basketball with his friends, he called his brother up to see if he could give him a lift, he said, no, walk home, and unfortunately Nicholas was never seen again. At first his family didn't panic about this, he, like I said, he was having arguments a lot, they thought, okay, he's just running away, he's just literally running away from his responsibilities, and... They weren't panicked, but then eventually he just never came back, which is when they sort of sounded the alarm and started panicking about where he could possibly be. Meanwhile, well not meanwhile, three years later, Nicholas Barclay hadn't turned up, but all the way over in Spain, Bordon was getting himself in a little bit of trouble. So he, again, had run away from a, another children's home and he was just planning to um, start his life fresh again as he'd done like hundreds and hundreds of time over. And then all of a sudden, Spanish authorities get a phone call from a Spanish couple. So this Spanish couple had found this teenager roaming the streets and they said he was very, very distressed. And they approached him and said, are you okay? He sort of told them that he had run away, he'd been sexually abused and he was lost, he didn't know where he was. So this Spanish couple phoned the police and were like, listen, we've got this American teenager here. We don't know how he ended up here, but you need to come and find him. <laughs> Guess what though? This Spanish couple didn't exist. It was Bourdon himself ringing the police and saying, reporting himself basically as being a missing American teenager. Just wanted to start his life again from scratch and was just like, yep, yeah, this is the way to do it. I'm a missing American teenager. So he got himself caught, do you mean? So he got, he reported himself because obviously he was just a 23 year old man at the time. No one is, he just wanted this love and affection, like a family to take him in. Obviously no Spanish couple is just gonna, well this Spanish couple didn't exist, but no one is just gonna go up to this, oh please sorry. Yeah, this 23 year old man just roaming around Spain, no one's gonna approach him and be like, are you okay, where's your parents? Cause he's a 23 year old man. Mm -hmm. So he was literally just like making up this phone call saying there's this lost, distressed boy himself, um, you need to come find him. Then eventually police came and found him and took him in and they were like, okay, so you need to tell us who you are. And he was just like, oh, he's been very, very vague about it, like, yeah, I'm oh, just this. And they're like, no, you need to tell us who you are, otherwise we're going to put you in jail, like you can't just mess us about like this. Like He started to panic and stuff and was like, okay. Let me ring my parent. Um, I can't ring them now because of the time difference in America. That it's not the middle of the night. Uh, let me just ring them tonight and then I'll just explain everything in the morning. So this is the first thing, which I don't know how this went down because, like, I don't know. Right, so he rang up in the night. He was left in an office and instead of ringing this American family, these parents, he didn't obviously ring them because he's not American, he's not a missing child from America. Instead, 
he rings up police stations all around America and is like, hi, we're the Spanish authorities, we've just found a missing American kid. And the police station's are like, right, we don't have time to go through every single missing child in America. So he was asked to give a description and then they sent a couple of missing posters from children over the last like few years back and that's when Bourdon found the black and white photo of Nicholas Barclay and was like, right, I'm just gonna say, yeah, you so, look like you've got a question, go on. Yeah, so at this point, was he not anybody in particular? Not anyone in particular, he just rang, he just wanted to start again and was like, yeah, I'm a missing American teenager. Oh, I see, so he wasn't trying to be anybody at that point. Not at that point. The then they start yeah. saying, you're going to go to jail if you don't tell us. And he starts panicking and he's like, right, yeah. I, need to, I, I need to think on my feet here. I don't want to go to a Spanish jail. I need to think on my feet here. Who can I pretend to be? So he gets his photo back, sees one of them that he's like, okay, yeah, I could get away with him. They both had a gap in their teeth. He's like, yeah, that's okay. I'll be... Nicholas Barclay. So that's what he does the next day. I've started as I don't know where he was not supervised in this investigation <laughs> because he was ringing police stations himself and everything. So that I don't get how that went down. And surely the police stations would just give out any old information. Yeah, well so he, he rang them up saying he was the police station in Spain and that they just found someone. But so he's he pretended in Spanish then I take it. No, he's French, he was just living in Spain, but he is fluent in English, mm. but obviously with a French accent. <laughs> so he's pretending to be this um, American kid, and he's like, yeah, uh, so we've got this American missing kid here who's speaking in like a French accent, which is weird enough, but I'll get on to his <laughs> explanation about why this kid's been missing for three years and suddenly speaks in a French accent. So his plan of just moving into a children's home and just starting his life from fresh. Uh, for starters, it seems a bit weird that a grown man just wants to be in a children's home. Yeah, but from his explanation, it generally just does seem like he was just missing that care and affection growing up, and he just wanted to relive that and get a second chance of having that. So he's just planning just to move into a children's home and do that. But obviously, without no children's home is just going to accept him. He looked older than he than he was saying to be as well. He was saying he was now 16 year old Nicholas Barclay. He looked older than that. And yeah, no children home was gonna accept him just based on him saying that he's a child. Like you can't do that. Like, mm. so they needed an explanation here. So then the next day he says to the authorities, hi, so I'm ready to tell you who I am now. Uh, now I'm ready. I am actually Nicholas Barclay. And they're like, oh, okay, that's amazing. We found you all the way in Spain, uh, all the way from America. So they actually get in contact with Nicholas's parents and family and they ring him up and like, three years later, we found your kid. He's all the way in Spain. And they're like, that is insane. He's not even got a passport. How did he end up in Spain? Like, they were mind blown, but obviously just so relieved that they found their son. They just wanted to bring him back into the family home and have their, their like missing son, missing brother back. Bordon is freaking out. He's like, shit, I'm in deep here. Like, as soon as this missing sister, they were already flying her over and flying FBI agents in and a American like ambassador in to come and collect him from Spain. He was like, I can't do this. Like, there's no way I can get away with that. Not even me. Like, I, I can't do that. So he was freaking out and he actually tried to run away at that point because he was like, mm. Like, I'm going to get in so much trouble here. Then the children's home and the authorities start freaking out because we're like, okay, we've got this missing kid. He must be so scared and traumatised. He's run away again. Uh, we need to find this kid. So they go on an absolute manhunt. But he was trying to hitchhike again. And then he was about to get in this person's car when he was spotted as the missing Nicholas Barclay. So they took him back to the police station at that point and he just was not allowed to run away. Right after that happening, when he was returned, he actually received a coloured photo, so bear in mind he was just going off the black and white facts through photos, like, I can definitely get away with this. He got through a coloured photo, I'll show you what um, he looked like. Mm -hmm. So that's what he looked like there, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. And then the coloured photo that he got through. And this is of the missing boy. Of the, miss the real life missing boy, he got the coloured photo through and that's him. <laughs> so he realised Nicholas Barkley is actually a blonde hair, blue eyed boy and that he looked nothing like him, like nothing like him at all. Furthermore, he realised on the missing person's details that Nicholas Barclay, at the age of 13 already, had three tattoos, <laughs> which he obviously didn't have, 
and he's freaking out. He's like, this is bad. Like, mm -hmm. so again, this is the next stage where I'm like, how was this allowed to progress at this stage? And why did no one call him out on this at this point? He went back to the children's home and he, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. He bleached his hair blonde. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and asked one of the girls, uh, at the children's home that did little tattoos, he asked her to give him three tattoos that day. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't like, the children's home for starters must be like, okay, I don't get why he came in a brunette and is leaving a blonde. Mm -hmm. Right when they're like trying to establish his identity. Like, I don't know how that was not flagged up, that he had different like looks and stuff. But at this point as well, he did used to like wear like hoodies, clothes, and like sunglasses and covered himself up quite a lot because obviously he was posing as a teenage boy he very clearly was not a teenage boy he had like a beard and everything like that how long ago was this what year uh this was in 1990 so in the 1990s he went missing in 1994 not, really. not that too recent to be able to get away <laughs> with this i think so anyway the sister flies in doesn't she and he is worried at this point like he remembers like he locked himself in the room all day and just did not speak to anyone and then when the sister arrived like someone came to his door and was like your sister's here uh he remembers looking out the window and just being like okay like he almost accepted his fate at that point he was like there's no way that this sister's not going to recognize that i'm not her brother like it's been three years which which is like, from ages 13 to 16, obviously lads change a lot. I, I would like to think, like, if I went missing from ages 13, if I was found again at 16, I'd be recognised uh, by my own family. But anyway, yeah, he, he was literally ready to go down and almost confess at that point. Just be like, not confess, but he was going in like, this is it. Game up, no chance I'm getting away with this. But to his surprise, his sister was just so excited to see him. And he was still covered up. He went in with the plan to be very, very quiet and very, very, like, not say a lot of words, not speak a lot. So he's just sort of saying very, very short sentences because obviously he spoke with a French accent. The sister was just so relieved that she found her missing brother. I think she just oversaw everything. And she also says that she recognised it was Nicholas straight away because he had her uncle's nose like he, she was like yep yeah, i remember your nose and he had the same nose as his uncle just by lucky coincidence i guess but uh so she was like yeah that's such a relief like he's back and she was just hugging and kissing him and everything and just so excited to see him the sister in all this is the person i would probably cut the most slack because i just couldn't imagine your brother going missing for like three years and then being reunited like that must be a whole sense of emotion she probably was not thinking straight. You'd like to think she would recognise him, but again, he did his best to make himself unrecognisable. She says she noticed his tattoo on his hand straight away, and like, honestly, who would think that in the space of a day, someone would go through all that effort as to faking yeah. a tattoo? So she was like, relieved. One thing she did, she, on this one-to-one -one meeting with her brother, she brought in family photos just to sort of start to welcome him back and, um, sort of open him up a bit again and she says like his whole body demeanor like she said he was so different but again she was like i have no idea what he's been through in the last three years like it wouldn't be surprising if he's completely a different person she was like we are not bringing back the same person that left us three years ago she was prepared for that that he's going to be changed and everything so she bought family photos to um like reconnect yeah. him and stuff and she was saying very, very leading questions to start off with. So she was saying, do you remember this is your uncle? Do you remember this is my daughter, your niece and everything like that? And saying names and everything. And just literally going through this whole photo album of just identifying basically all his family members there and then. And then she started to be convinced that this was Nicholas because he was sort of saying details to her about the family members. Apart from these were very, very, very vague details so he'd be like oh is that mum she's put on weight or is granddad still an asshole and stuff like that so just very very generic things or like i miss grandma and stuff like that so she thought they were bonding and that it was memories but he was just saying very very short little snippets and just hoping he'd get away with it so the time comes to try and get nicholas barkley back to america he's thinking to himself do i run away again 
like this whole this poor family he's like i can't do this to a family he's like okay i might have fooled the sister but there's no way i can fool an entire family mm. and he's starting to think to himself do i run away but he's also thinking that of course like if you say you're a missing family member the first thing you do would be on that flight and come over so he started sympathizing for like the family as well and saying this family clearly is missing their son he almost in himself was justifying it as listen i've been given a clean slate here this family's obviously very willing to accept me into their life and he was like almost to himself the kindest thing to do would just be to go along and be this missing family member that they're so clearly craving so he started going along with it they were flying him back to america Obviously, he didn't have a passport. He ended up in Spain without a passport from America. Obviously, he wasn't from America. That's how he managed to do it. So in order to test that this was definitely Nicholas Barclay, uh, DNA samples, anything like that, no, no. So the one determination to prove that this was Nicholas Barclay was he was shown five pictures of family members. As you know, his sister just literally gone through the entire family tree of who's who, showing him pictures and everything like that, and for some reason it wasn't flagged up that the sister had shown him pictures already, that was the one determination. And he got four out of five right because he was just like memorising who all these family members were. So yeah, he guessed four out of five family members and that was enough for the judge to be like, you're going home, Nicholas. There you are. See you on your flight. <laughs> and, which is so ridiculous to me. I can't believe that, like, that was the only amount of evidence to send this person back home. So, Nicholas Bourdain is very, very nervous this whole flight home. He's like, am I going to get away with it with the, when the family's there? Um, he's also thinking the whole time, like, always on edge. He's like, what if the real Nicholas walks through the door at any given point? Yeah, it was also said that after Nicholas went missing, uh, his uncle or brother, I keep seeing him, like this guy Jason, being called his brother or uncle, but I think he's his brother. Apparently, a few weeks after Nicholas went missing, he was spotted by him trying to break into the family garage again, and then he was seen him, and then he ran away, and that was the last time he was ever spotted. So, Bourdon's stressing a lot because he's like, this real guy could walk in at any given point and then it's game over for me, I'm going to be in big trouble when that happens. So he's very, very nervous, but he's reunited with his family at home and there's video footage of him being reunited with his family. They seem very, very distressed, like the family themselves, like God knows what they've been through the last three years. So they're, they're all a bit in shock and Bourdon still has like his coat up and everything like that, it's very, very like hidden away. Uh, but the family was very, very happy to have Nicholas back. They took him in again and life started to resume as normal for Bourdon. He was becoming Nicholas. He was going to school as Nicholas. He was speaking to friends, going hanging out with other teenagers, other teenagers, mm -hmm. with teenagers. And everything was just sort of falling into place. He was very happy that he got this chance to go to school in America and then really make something of himself. He's been given this identity, his family are like accepting him and he just wants to be the best Nicholas that he can be, which is just insane. But meanwhile, FBI agents are starting to grow worried because they're like, this guy's been missing. Someone's kidnapped him and took him to Spain. We want to get to the bottom of who's done this to him. So for a while they sort of gave him space and respected that he might be uh, healing from trauma, so they didn't want to push him too much, but when the family never contacted the FBI to sort of get to the bottom of what was going on, Nancy Fisher, the FBI agent, reached out to um, the Barclay family and were like, we need to get to the bottom of this. So they took him to a like interview. So Nancy Fisher started to realise that this whole thing just doesn't seem to add up. It looks a bit suspicious. He looks older than a 16 year old. She noticed he had a very, very dark beard, which she just didn't think a 16 year old would have at that point. The whole story didn't add up. He had a non-American accent, which is already bizarre enough. And they took him to somewhere where they said to the family they're taking him to help heal with his trauma, but they just sort of started to try and get to the bottom of what's going on here. He says this story. He could have gone easy, but no. He just makes up this whole elaborate story. And the weird thing is, I've seen him 
talk about this and when he's actually talking about it he talks about it still to this day it's all come out that it's a load of nonsense obviously but even the way he still speaks about it, it's very like it seems like he believes it himself but he says he was taken home from the park one day when he was playing basketball he was approached by two boys and then all of a sudden he just had this cloth put over him and he was like sent to sleep and he woke up he was put on a plane he didn't know where he was going to and that he was involved in this child sex trafficking ring and that this was done by military officials that it was all people in the same uniform he didn't know who he was speaking to there was kids from all over the world and these military officials just kept these kids and then he started to use this story to say why he had a different accent and different eye colour as well, get this right. So he says that these military officials did everything they can to make sure that these kids did not have their identity anymore. They said that they were beaten if they were spoke English, so he was not allowed to speak English, he was uh, only allowed to speak a mixture of Spanish and French, which I don't know if you can lose your American accent within three years if you've been American your whole life. Also, he says that they put needles in their eyes and solutions in their eyes, which is why his eyes changed right from blue to brown, and they did everything they can to erode his like identity. As if indeed. Mm -hmm. Obviously the FBI were like, sounds weird but okay. So they're starting to look into it a bit more which is when they hire a private investigator, Charlie Parker, to look into it on the down low. They didn't want any sort of, they, they didn't want it to get out that this investigation was ongoing because they were like, obviously if this is real, like they were still under the impression that someone had kidnapped him and they didn't want it to get out that they're looking into military officials and everything like that they did not want this story to get out so they actually advised for there to be little to no media coverage on this case whatsoever because they didn't want the people that had done this to know that they're onto them bordan has a very very different idea this is eyewitness news at 10. he disappeared without a trace three years ago tonight a san antonio boy is back home Nicholas Barclay is now 16 years old. He vanished when he was 13. Nicholas says he was kidnapped and taken to Spain. He says for three years he was repeatedly drugged, beaten, and raped, all part of a sex slave operation involving dozens of missing children. And he starts to just assume this life as Nicholas Barclay. He wants people to almost admire what he's been through. And he gets wrapped up in this whole idea that he is Nicholas Barclay. And like I said before, it seems to get to the point where he believes it himself. He tells a story of like all these horrific things that have happened to him and other children to the point where like even the FBI agents were like, no one could make this, like who in their right mind would make this up? And meanwhile, while this was going on, a private investigator, Charlie Parker, took it upon himself. He's seen all this going on in the news and media and he was like, I've heard this case, what is going on here? And he wanted to get to the bottom of it like himself. And one day he watched this interview happening of Nicholas uh, Barclay telling his ordeal and he says it was like fate because he was watching Bourdon tell his story and then in the background of the shot there was a picture of the real Nicholas Barclay like I said before he already looked too old to be Nicholas Barclay but he just did not buy the whole <laughs> military putting needles in his eyes to change his eye colour thing he didn't even think that was possible which I don't think is possible and when I went to the house during the interview uh, I was fortunate enough to have the real Nicholas Barclay's photograph sitting right by me and the imposter was being interviewed. I noticed that the, the real Nicholas Barclay had blue gray eyes. The imposter's eyes were brown. And I asked the cameraman to zoom in on his ears. His it's ears? A, it's a technique Scotland Yard uses uh, yeah. to identify people. Uh, the ear is the only part of the human body that doesn't age. Hmm. And I knew if I could compare the ears, I could, I could know what I had here. So I got to uh, my office, compared the ears, and I knew instantly I had an imposter. You passed the eye thing. Well, the eye test, what happened is he claimed that he had, a, had chemicals injected into his eyes by his captors. I telephoned an ophthalmology school. And they said it's just not possible. They said right. it's not possible. No. So obviously you can change your hair colour, you can make up a reason why you're not having like your own accent anymore. But he was like, no way, 
is it possible this guy's changed his ears? Like, no way if that's Nicholas, he's changed his ears. This is a different person. So he starts to freak out himself because he's like, why is this person? Who is he? Why is he pretending to be a school kid and living with his family? He was really, 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 really worried about the family themselves because he was like, they've just taken in someone, we don't know who he is, he had thought he had really bad or more, or like ulterior motives to be in America, he was like, this guy is a danger. So yeah, the whole team that's looking into this is getting very, very suspicious that this is Nicholas Barclay, and they actually demand, start demanding, finally, DNA tests. They go to the mum, Beverly, and she starts lying down on the floor. She's like, I'm not getting involved with the SBI. I know they don't need anything from me. Mrs. Dollar Hyde said, this is my son. I don't have to provide blood samples for you for DNA. And she lay down on the floor, literally lay down on the floor uh, and said, no, and you can't pick me up and you can't make me. They also start to tell Carrie, his sister that flew over and stuff. They were like, we really don't think that this is Nicholas. When he was flying back uh, to the family home, they were like, don't worry, we won't we won't let him come back into your home, this is not your son from what we know, we won't let him come in. Carrie goes and picks Bordan up from the airport as if the whole phone call didn't happen and they just go back to life as normal and then like everyone's getting worried at this point because they're like who is this guy and finally they get a warrant to go and take DNA samples from everyone. Uh, they detain Bordan again and he is freaking out, he's really freaking out because he's like Okay, the DNA tests are coming back, I'm, I'm a goner, like. And then eventually, Charlie Parker takes him out for a meal and he sits him down and he's just trying the whole reverse psychology on him. And he's just like, what's going on here? Your mum's really, really worried about you. And then at that point, Bodon, he just knows the game's up and he just looks him dead in the eye and goes, that's not my mum and you know it. And then, obviously, Charlie did know it, but he was just so, like, mind-blown that he really like admitted it, he was like, no, no way, no way, he's like, I've actually just got it out of him, okay, and he starts going down, he's like, right, so, who are you, and he tells him, my name's Frederick Bourdon, I'm wanted by Interpol, and like, this guy is freaking out, because he's like, if he's wanted internationally, what has he done to be wanted on such a global scale, and then they take the DNA samples, uh, they match him to Bourdon, and they find out that he has had a criminal record of trying to impersonate people for years and years because this isn't the first time he's ever been caught out but it's the first time he's been caught out on this scale like, like all the way in America and like everything like that so it's finally revealed he's not, he's not Nicholas Barclay the family, they act very very shocked about this news they're like, well, could have fooled us and this whole thing is like when Bourdain himself, he starts to points the finger of blame and he flips the whole story on his head because he's been living with this family for months I think it was three to five months he was living with this family and he was saying no way have I fooled this family no chance and like I said before like if I went missing I'd like to think my own family would recognize if an imposter turned up obviously he dyes his hair blonde like he'd get roots and stuff like that like there's no way he thought, no way on earth have I fooled this family. So he starts to think, this is way too convenient that this family was just happy to accept an imposter into their family. And he starts th questioning himself, he's like, what has this family done to Nicholas to just be like, oh, thank you for finding him, yeah, that's him. When Beverly refused to give her blood sample, I started to become suspicious. They knew that I was a Nicholas, Whatever I was telling them, they didn't believe a word of it. So he starts to like look back at all the events and he also makes some pretty drastic claims, which I'll get onto. So he starts to think, okay, maybe it was deliberate that Carrie bought that family album and was like, do you remember him? This is him. Like, yeah, this is everyone. Like, this is them. And he starts to think either family members were involved in the disappearance of Nicholas Barclay or some were aware that something might have happened to Nicholas and were just like brushing it off and just not going there, not thinking about it. So he thinks that someone in the family knows what happened to Nicholas Barclay. He starts pointing the finger then at Nicholas Barclay's older brother slash uncle. I don't think it is a slash, uh, slash uncle slash brother situation, it's just I see 
different reports on who he is, but Jason Dollarhide. This is where it starts to look a bit suspicious. Um, so, as this was all coming out and as they started to get warrants for DNA samples, Charlie was actually meant to go and interview Jason himself on a separate occasion. However, Jason was actually a recovering drug addict and a few days before this was meant to happen, he overdosed and he passed away from it. So Bourdon was like, this looks a bit dodgy because he was in recovery. He hadn't touched drugs for ages and then as soon as this happened, he supposedly overdosed. So he thinks it was a suicide, but obviously that was not determined. Carrie is very, very upset about this whole story. She's like, it's so easy to pass the blame onto someone that's not here to defend themselves anymore. And then Bourdain starts making all these different claims like when he returned home as Nicholas he said Jason after a few days came to the house and he it's very clear to him that he was not accepting him as Nicholas that he just walked in did not even entertain the idea that this was Nicholas and all this and he just was not looking at him and he was just like just, okay mate and then he apparently left and just looked at Bourdain and just went good luck and then just left he was just like yeah good luck he also claims that the mother was very very hostile to him behind the scenes and that they got in plenty of arguments about it and that at one day she just stood there and screamed at him i don't know who you are but why are you doing this to our family so that for him is a red sign like that she knows what was happening to like the real Nicholas Barclay because imagine say for argument's sake the family did know what happened to Nicholas Barclay and they were just trying to brush it off you would be freaked out if three years later from the other side of the world someone phones up saying hi I'm your missing son I'm coming home <laughs> like they but they'd be forced to let him in and in that scenario they can't say it's not him they he thinks that they were looking for a scapegoat and just accepting anyone into the family that uh, just is a like way to be like it's it's him see and they that he says like he knew Nicholas was not coming home at that point and he says that he knew that the family knew that Nicholas was not coming home and that there'd be no chance of him coming home which is why they were so willing to accept this complete stranger into their home saying that it was Nicholas. Obviously his family have denied this claims. Nicholas Barclay homicide investigation was eventually drawn to an end because there was no evidence that the family was actually involved in the death of Nicholas Barclay and his sister's so upset about these claims. Uh, his mother's obviously very upset about these claims. It just all looks very, very suspicious, but like as the family say, they said there's not been one shred of evidence that they've been involved in the Nicholas Barclay case, and why would you trust someone who is known to be a complete liar? When he was arrested as well, he was still phoning up families of missing children and saying he knew the whereabouts of these children and stuff like that, and when later questioned they were like you have no knowledge about this case do you and he was just like no i don't actually why did you do that you didn't have any information did you no but you get on this phone and you call the So he is a compulsive liar, so his family are like, why would you listen to a compulsive liar? But when you look at the evidence as well, it's just such a strange story because why would you accept someone into your home? Why did Jason overdose a couple of days before being interviewed? Why did the family refuse to do DNA samples if they were innocent? It's just a whole story that just does not add up either way that you look at it and it's still unsolved to this day what happened to Nicholas Barclay, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued to know what you guys think. Uh, obviously, uh, innocent until proven guilty, I'm not pointing the blame on anyone in particular. Bourdon is known to be a compulsive liar. But again, the whole story just sits uneasy and it was almost too convenient. So just to finish this video off, I thought I'd go into um, Bourdon's life after Nicholas Barclay a little bit. So he was sentenced, obviously, and rightfully so, uh, for impersonating Nicholas Barclay. You can't do that to a family. Um, and he was sentenced for six years in jail, which is actually twice the amount of recommended time but they were just like, were locking this person away. In 2007, Bourdon actually went away and 
married a French woman named Isabel and they ended up having five children together after this all went down from so from 2007 onwards he did that someone married him yeah so yeah there's someone out there for everyone <laughs> or so you'd think uh, after 10 years she did actually end up divorcing him and took away all his children like they ran away and they've not been heard of since and the current whereabouts of his family are unknown to this day. Bourdon is actually claiming to this day that he's never going to impersonate anyone again. He's accepted he is Bourdon. And yeah, it's been like questioned why Bourdon didn't just put all this energy into like acting or something because he would have been an amazing <laughs> actor. Yeah, if he'd only put his energy into the right things but crazy story from start to finish i'm intrigued to know what you guys think uh have you ever heard anything like this because i know for a fact i i really really haven't and yeah that has been today's video uh thanks for watching uh, if you've made it to the end i know it's been quite a long one uh not normally this long but just thought i had to share yeah i'm looking at doing more stories like this i've got a few more lined up which are <laughs> just crazy in a whole other level but yeah Unfortunately, I the person I feel the most guilty for in the whole of this is Nicholas Barclay. He didn't get his his disappearance solved. This is an injustice to him on so many levels and yeah, what a traumatic experience for everyone involved to be honest. It's yeah, just did not need to go down like this. Um but yeah, thanks for watching and I will see you guys soon. Bye. <laughs>